morning. He is risen. Uh, we're so glad to have you here worshiping with us uh, on your screens, and we've got just a handful of people here worshiping together. Uh, but we're so glad to get a chance to, to worship uh, the center of our faith. Uh, we believe in a God who has died for us and has been vindicated with new life, and we celebrate that resurrection life this morning. So we're, we're excited to have you joining our, new, our Facebook feed. If we lose the feed, I know we had a slight difficulty last week. If we lose the feed, we'll pause everything here and we'll get it started up again and wait for people to get a chance to get back on the feed and we'll start up again. So, so don't worry about that. Uh, we're going to continue in worship. I'm going to uh, pray us through a bit of Psalm 102 and we're going to continue singing our praises to God. Let this be written for a future generation that a people not yet created may praise Yahweh. Yahweh looked down from his sanctuary on high, from heaven he viewed the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners and release those condemned to death. God, we thank you this morning that we worship a God who didn't just look down from on high, but who came down. 
a God who, who has released the prisoners from death, starting with the first fruits of Jesus, released from the grave, in resurrection glory. Thank you that we can celebrate that and that we can experience that new life in you even now. And so we sing with joy that Christ is risen. It's in your name we, we sing these words. Amen. Sin remain inside the lion in word chain, but fix our eyes upon the cross and run to him who showed great love and bled for us freely bled. from the dead, tripping over death by death. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with death again. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Peter 1, 3 to 8. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, 
though now for a little while, while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. And Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever man may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks to me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives within my heart. All the world around me, I see his love and care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that He is leading through all the stormy blasts. His appearing will come at last. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks to me. Along life's narrow way, he lives, lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The help of all who seek Him, the help of all who come. It's so loving, so good and kind. Chapter 15, verses 20 to 26 and 54 to 57. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the firstfruits. Then, when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For the Father has put everything under his feet. Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? 
Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Prodigal is welcomed home, the sinner now was saved. For the God who died came back to life, and everything is changed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of Kings has disarmed you, delivered and redeemed. Eternal life is ours. Oh, praise His name forever. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. I'll see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. Through tears of joy, I'll lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. crashed your thunder, who shook the earth and scared the wits out of chaos. 
You God, who with strong arm saved your people by miracle and wonder and majestic act. You are the same God to whom we turn. We turn in our days of trouble and in our weary nights. We look for steadfast love and are dismayed. We wait for your promises, but wait in fatigue. We ponder your forgetfulness and lack of compassion, and we grow silent. Our lives addressed to you have this bittersweet taste of loud clashing miracles and weak need doubt. So we come in our bewilderment and wonderment, deeply trusting, almost afraid to trust much, passionately insisting, too timid to insist much, fervently hoping, exhausted for hoping too much. Look upon us in our deep need, Mark the wounds of our brothers and sisters just here. Notice the turmoil in our lives and the lives of our families. Credit the incongruity of the rich and the poor in our very city and the staggering injustices abroad in our land. Tend to the rage out of control, rage justified by displacement, rage gone crazy by absence, silence and deprivation. Measure the suffering, count the sufferers, number the wounds. You tamer of chaos and mender of all tears in the canvas of creation, we ponder your suffering, your crown of thorns, your garment taken in lottery, your mocked life. And now we throw upon your suffering humiliation, the suffering of the world. You defeater of death, whose power could not hold you, come in your Easter, come in your sweeping victory, come in your glorious new life. Easter us, salve wounds, break injustice, bring peace, guarantee neighbour. Easter us in joy and strength. Be our God, be your true self, Lord of life. Massively turn our life toward your life and away from our anti-neighbour, anti-self deathliness. Hear our thankful, grateful, unashamed hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives, he lives, who once was dead. He lives, my ever-living dead. Lives to silence all my fears. He lives to wipe away my tears. He lives to calm my troubled heart. He lives all blessings to He lives all blessings to him. He lives to grant me daily bread. He lives and I shall conquer death. He lives and I shall he lives my prophet, please and
Let's pray together. God of the bright and morning star, God of the rising sun, God of darkness banished, we praise and worship you. For empty tombs, thank you. Disciples running with good news, thank you. For your presence, alive, powerful, resurrected, thank you. We celebrate your victory over death, over all the powers that would defeat us. May we cling to that truth, that victory, even more tightly this year. Help us to grasp resurrection, to understand its power, to see its force at work in our world, overturning evil empires, changing the hatred within us, moving the world slowly, forcefully, bending us towards love and truth. On this day of great gladness, empower us to be your ambassadors, proclaiming good news. Good news in our kitchens and living rooms, good news over webcams and social media, good news in the grocery store or wherever else we tread. Help us to be that good news embodied, walking softly on this good earth, caring gently for all people, living hopefully into your kingdom. Today we pray for all who are grieving, especially those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19 all throughout the world. We pray for those who are mourning the loss of jobs, the loss of community connection and resources, and the loss of stability. Today we pray for the sick and dying, Pray for Barry Norris and his wife, Dorothy. Be with them in their ongoing struggle. We pray for Jen and Dave Haino, each dealing with their own medical struggles. We pray for all those who are in assisted living, who are especially isolated these days. Today, we pray for the places in the world that are torn by war and bloodshed especially those who are in refugee camps around the world, looking hopefully for an abundant life. Now we thank you that sickness, famine, war, and death don't get the final word. In this world of broken hopes and dreams, we catch glimpses of your kingdom come in the person of Jesus Christ, who, as he called out to Mary in the garden, calls us by name, and everything has changed. Amen. Well, this is the part of the service where we usually pass the peace. We, we greet each other. We say good morning. So I'm just going to encourage you, just take a second. Think about people you're usually sitting around. Give yourself a, an alarm or a reminder to send a text. Reach out to somebody. Send a Facebook message now or just hug the person next to you. Uh, but let's make sure we're staying connected as a community of believers. My heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart.
Good morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Despite our distance from one another, despite the crazy mixed up world that we live in, despite the uncertainty of the near future, there is one thing that we can know for sure, and that is the foundation for everything else. And that is that he is risen. He is risen indeed. And it's good to be here today. It's good to be all across our town where you are. It's good to be even beyond that as you tune in from far away, to celebrate the fact that death does not get the last word. We're going to wrap up today our time in the Gospel of John by looking at John chapter 20. All week long in our church, through our reflective guide, we've been focusing on these last days of Jesus. On Good Friday, we remember the crucifixion. Yesterday, as, as the body of Christ laid in the tomb, we were remembering the silence of God. And today we pick up early in the morning of that first Resurrection Sunday. And John gives us his retelling of the event that changes everything. And as I read the text from John chapter 20, I want you to pay attention to the different characters that John highlights and, and their encounters with both the empty tomb and the risen Jesus. And then we're going to walk back through what the text might be saying us, to us today. In John chapter 20, verses 1 to 31, this is the word of the Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark... Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. And then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside, and he saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. And at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Digimus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. 
A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And Jesus did other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by, by believing you may have life in his name. You can tell as we read the text that John wants us to see this morning, this story, from the perspective of different people and their different responses. John differs a lot from the other three Gospels and the way he lays out the story of Jesus in his Gospel. He, he has a unique approach to telling the good news of Jesus. He wants to communicate uh, who Jesus is as the Son of God. And as he retells the story of that resurrection moment, he shows us several different responses to what happens. The first character that we see in John's narrative is Mary Magdalene. And we see her making assumptions and we see her mourning. The other Gospels tell us she was not alone. There was a group of women going to the tomb that morning, but John focuses his attention slowly, solely on Mary Magdalene for a reason. I think he wants us to look more closely at her in response to this event. And, and the two things I said that I want to look at initially, I'm sure there's others to see, but first we see that she, like all of us, comes into a situation and immediately makes assumptions. The stone was rolled away, the body was gone, so she assumed that someone had taken the body away. She immediately runs to Peter and John. We'll look at them in a minute. She tells him what's happened. And after they all come back and see all this, it, it, it's, it says she stays at the tomb. She stands by the tomb crying. And that's the other thing she's doing. She's mourning. You see, Mary has a past. She was loved and accepted by Jesus while most of the religious would have rejected her. Mark and Luke tell us she was, quote, one of whom seven demons had gone out of. You know, the, the reality is she's mentioned in all four Gospels, and it might surprise you to realize Mary Magdalene is mentioned more than any other woman in the Gospels, even more than Mary, the mother of Jesus, 14 times. And, and, and it just shows how Jesus loved even Mary Magdalene, a woman of questionable reputation, who'd had demons exercised out of her. And if you've been loved when you felt unlovely, and then you lose that person, I think you understand a little bit of what she felt like. We've all had those moments, those moments of grief when someone who has loved us in a way that touched us deeply is gone. I can remember in my own life, I think back to when my dad died. I remember sitting in the kitchen of my living room. We were on Skype and my whole family was in the room with him. And they were singing hymns, and then my brother said, he's gone, Jeff. And I just remember that moment. I can remember hearing about my friend Matt, who had died in a drowning accident, and just the grief that overwhelmed. That's, that's where Mary is right now. We've all lost someone who loved us, and that's what Mary's feeling. And even when someone asks her why she's crying, she can't move past those assumptions. Even when she sees two angels sitting there. It, it's not enough to break her out of her assumptions. And she turns and she, she thinks it's the gardener. And she says, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him and I'll go get him. And even then you, we realize grief isn't logical. Can you imagine Mary thinking, I'm going to carry the dead weight of that whole body back and put him in his tomb? It doesn't make sense. John highlights her grief and the assumptions that she's made that intensify it. He also points out Peter and John, who I say they looked, they left, and question mark, they believed, or at least John believed. Mary goes to get them, and they run to the tomb. Uh, John is writing the story, so he calls himself the other disciple, and he's younger. He gets ahead. Peter's a little older, a little slower. I can identify with that. Uh, they get to the tomb, and John stands outside looking in, and it says he sees the burial strips lying there. Peter arrives second, and just like you would expect Peter to do, he goes right into the tomb. He sees the strips there as well as the head cloth. And Peter's boldness in entering the tomb gives John courage. So John comes in and he says he, they saw it. And John says he believed. Now, when I read that, I think, what did he believe? 
Did he believe Jesus' body was gone? Did Peter believe? John even says at that moment, he says, they still didn't understand. They, me and Peter, he says, we didn't understand that he was supposed to be resurrected from the dead. And so we don't really know exactly what he believed. But he says, he, the other disciples saw it and believed. But what did they do? I find this really interesting. It says, then they went home in verse 10. They came to see, they saw, and they went home. Why not go back to the others? They left with some sort of belief, or at least John did. Maybe Peter did. We don't know that he didn't. But why did they go home and not back to the other 12? We don't know. Mary stayed mourning by the tomb. Peter and John looked, saw, believed, and left. And then we come probably to the most well-known of the reactions to the events of the morning. Thomas, the one who needed tangible proof. I have wondered why this story gets told over and over and over. I think more people know this story about doubting Thomas than a lot of the resurrection encounters. But maybe it's because deep down we can identify with Thomas's honesty. Even though Jesus had appeared to the others, and they were all telling Thomas he's afraid to get his hopes up. Unless I can see the nail marks, unless I can touch his hands, unless I can put my hand into his side, Thomas says, I need to know that the guy you saw was the same guy that I saw on the cross. I don't want an imposter. And John isolates these interactions with all these people, I think because we are these people. Like Mary, we've tasted the love of God and we, we mourn the brokenness of the world and we make assumptions about how God will work in a given situation. He doesn't always work that way. Like Peter and John, we come and, and we take a look and, and we believe to some degree. But then we just kind of go back into our lives. We don't think about all the implications of that belief. Or like Thomas, you know, we've been burned and we're cautious with how much we're going to trust. Prove it to me. The good news is that just like he does with us, Jesus meets them where they are. John gives us these glimpses into each different reaction, and I think he's doing it to show that Jesus goes to all those places where the people are to reveal himself. He comes to us. That's the whole point of the gospel, is that Jesus comes to where we are. And he comes to Mary, and we see Mary being called by name and to mission. Mary recognized this was no gardener when he said her name. The only thing that could pierce through all her assumptions and her ideas and her preconceived notions of what was happening, not even the two angels, but it was Jesus saying her name. And it speaks to the power of a relationship. How many of you have been going through a situation that you just didn't know how you were going to make it? You didn't understand what God was doing. You, you didn't see the way forward, but someone came into that relationship to be with you in that moment. And even though you still didn't understand how you were going to make it, you felt the strength of not being alone. It made it easier to bear. Just seconds before she's in mourning, and now she just can't believe that he's with her. And, and he doesn't try to make her understand. He doesn't try to explain everything. He just says her name. He just wants her to know that he is there with her. And, you know, often I think that's what we need in mourning. We don't need an answer, even though we want one. We just need not to be alone. I was sitting with someone this week on his front deck, and we were socially distant, so no, don't worry about that. But he's, this, this guy I'm sitting with has gone through more health challenges, I think, than anyone I've ever seen. And he was saying, I just want to know why. I just want to know what's the lesson that I'm supposed to learn. And I'm sitting there, the pastor who has no reason why. I don't have an answer for him. And all I could really do was be with him. And as I, I drove away, I thought, what can you do in that situation? I think that's all we can do is know that he is with us, even when we don't understand. That he calls us by name in the middle of our grief, in the middle of our mourning, in the middle of our struggle. And then he calls her to mission. He says, Mary, I want you to go and tell my brothers this thing. And I, I love this part of the story because this is the most important. I think if you look at any gospel message, this is the most earth-shattering news that's ever been told. And Jesus 
decides to give it to a woman who's been cast aside by the religious elites, a woman who's looked down upon by society. And he meets us in our mourning, in our brokenness, in our weakness, in our failure. He calls us by name, and then he sends us out to tell the world. And that's exactly what Mary does. This formerly demon-possessed woman with a questionable reputation is the first ambassador of the risen Jesus. And that says to me that no matter what your past is, what our past is, we're still called to be a part of God's vision for the future. When we look at Peter and John and the others, we see with the disciples that Jesus' peace turns fear to joy. In verse 19 to 23, he shows up with, with all the disciples together, the doors locked for fear of the Jews. They're locked away in fear. Does that sound familiar? We're locked away in fear. And it's for good reason, right? They've killed the leader. There's, there's good reason to believe that Rome will come after them as well. And Jesus shows up, and what were his first words to them? It wasn't, hey, you know, a few days ago, I wish you guys hadn't run out on me. <laughs> I really could have used some support through that difficult time. Why did you leave? Or he didn't say, you stupid disciples, I've been telling you this all along. His first words to them were, peace be with you. And in case they didn't hear it, he says it again, peace be with you. This was the one who had stood in the boat in the middle of the storm and said, peace, be still. And now he stands in the middle of the room in the storm that they're enduring of their fear and questions and doubt. And he says, peace be with you. And it, and it turns their fear to joy. It says in verse 20, they were overjoyed. And he sent them on mission too. He said, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. But we all know there was one person missing, right? The doubter. And yet even with Thomas, Jesus helps him believe. I love this scene, other than the weird parts about touching the wounds putting the hand in the side. I get a little creepy feeling about that. But Thomas doubts. He's the skeptic. And a week has passed, and he shows up. What's the first thing Jesus says? Peace be with you. And once again, he doesn't show up and say to Thomas, you should have believed those guys. There's no I told you so in it. He meets Thomas right where Thomas is, right at the point of his doubt. He says, here, here you go, Thomas. Touch. Here's my side. Now stop doubting and believe. You see, Jesus meets all of them where they are, and he calls them to move forward on mission, which brings us to the question, the one that takes this event from 2,000 years ago right into the present. The question is, today, what is our response to the resurrection? As we stand around looking at this empty tomb, the question isn't how did they react. The question is how will we react? And we can learn from them. But the heart of the matter is, what do we take to heart from this? How will I respond to the empty tomb and, and Jesus calling me to mission? Well, here's some ideas. First of all, like Mary, Peter, John, and Thomas, the best thing you can do is let Jesus meet you wherever you are. We all have this internal tendency to hide where we are, to make things look better about us than we actually are, to fix ourselves up so that others will think well of us. But with Jesus, the call is to let him come to wherever and however you really are. If you're broken and needy, if you've blown it in so many ways this week, if you're ashamed, if you're faithless, the, the call is to let him come to you right there, not where you think you need to be, but where you are. I love John or Matthew 9, 36, Jesus crosses over the the Sea of Galilee, he gets out of the boat and it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Once again, in Psalm 103, it's my favorite Psalm. I keep saying that every time I mention it in a sermon because I want you to know if I die, that's at my funeral. My kids are sitting over there, write it down. Psalm 103, my favorite section, verses 10 to 14. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are but dust. 
Of course, you've got to hear about the kid who heard that in the sermon and turned to his mom after they said it. He remembers that we are but dust. And the kid said, what's but dust? We are but dust. You got you to you appreciate that when you read it, right? But the point is, we have nothing really to offer God. We are where we are. But he doesn't wait for us to come to a certain point where we're worthy. He comes to us right where we are. The, the scripture says all through it that without him, we are spiritually dead. But that's why the resurrection is such good news. Because if you're a God that has resurrection power, you can come all the way to dead people. When I was in, uh, in Israel, I bought this. Reed's going to put a picture of it up on the screen. It's, it's an icon. Some of you may be weirded out by icons. I, I'm not praying to an icon. This is not some weird thing we're doing. Icons were used by the church in its history to teach theological truth to people who couldn't read. They, they would teach the theological truth visually. And this icon is called the resurrection. And I love this icon because this picture teaches me things about the resurrection. It, it, on it, you see Jesus and he's, he's, he's entering the gates of hell and he's trampling on the gates of hell. I love it. He's, he's stomping on the gates of hell. And if you look at the bottom of the icon, you see Satan and he's bound up underneath. He's all tied up. He's rendered helpless. And the two people coming out of their, their coffins, out of their sarcophagi, whatever they are, are Adam and Eve. And if you'll notice, you maybe you can't see it, but you can Google this resurrection icon and you'll see it. Jesus has them by the wrist, right? It's not like they've reached up to him and grabbed his arm and they're pulling together. He's reached in because they're dead. And he's grabbed them from the wrist and is lifting them up. I love this. They have nothing to offer. But that's okay because Jesus goes to where they are and he grabs them by the wrist and lifts them up, resurrecting them. What a powerful truth that is. I don't know your situation, but wherever you are, not where you wish you were, not where you think you should be, but where you are, the first step to the resurrection is to let Jesus meet you there. And then second, as you follow him, hold to your assumptions loosely. How many of you have ever been surprised by the way that God works? It, it usually, that's the one spiritual truth is that it never goes the way I think it should go or would go. Everyone in the story that we read from John 20 woke up that morning with an assumption about how the day would pass and they were all wrong. It's not bad to have assumptions. I think as humans, we can't really avoid it. The key is to let them go when we need to let them go. Corey Ten Boom says, hold everything in your hands lightly. Otherwise, it hurts when God pries your fingers open. And I think that's some of our decisions about the way God should do things and the way he's going to work and what we expect from him. We need to hold on to that loosely. You remember Peter, I, I go back to this over and over, but it's such a powerful image. He says, you're the Messiah. And then after that, in Mark, Jesus says, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders the chief priests, the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Well, there's an idea. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Peter, you need to let those concerns, you need to let those assumptions go. And here's the bottom line. We don't ever have all of the story. We've only got part of it. Our understanding is limited at the very best. We don't have it all. God is revealing his plan for us and his leadership of us day by day. And that's why he sends the spirit, because it's not like a transfer of information. Here's your instructions. It's a relationship he invites us to. It says in John 16, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. There's this relationship. And, and we, we, we have assumptions about how it's going to look, but we have to hold them loosely and we have to reorient everything around relationship. I love what he said to Mary in John in verse 17. Do not hold on to me for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers 
and tell them, I'm returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. He's, he's changing everything. Everything now is reoriented around the relationship they have with each other and with God. That was his whole goal in coming. We were separated. We were dead. We were spiritually cut off from God. And the cross and the resurrection has changed that. And it's brought us into a family, but it's even more profound and deeper than family. Jesus prayed in John 17, just before he died. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's me and you. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe. What does that even mean? That we may be one, not just related as family, but one, the same person. And that we can be in the Father the way the Father is in the Spirit and the Son, that somehow we're all brought together. See, we have to reorient everything in our life around that relationship. And two things happen when we do that. First, when we're reoriented with our whole life around our relationship with each other and God, something like COVID, doesn't destroy us because we're not oriented around circumstances anyway. We're not oriented around our normal rhythms. We're oriented around a relationship. And second, because we have that relationship as the central, this relationship with God, our relationships with each other are more important. We take care of each other. And finally, we have to respond to a living Jesus by letting belief, also known as faith, fuel life. I put the Greek word in the outline there, Zoe. John uses this word believe over and over again in the chapter. If you read it, verse 8, verse 25, verse 26, verse 29. And then in verse 31, he says, these are written, these signs, these things he's written about, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. There's two main Greek words used for life. There's bios, which is like biology, our physical, tangible life. And there's zoe, which is this spiritual life power that we we live in conjunction with god we receive this from him and and it's this idea is all throughout the new testament john 10 10 the thief comes only to steal steal kill and destroy i have come that they may have life zoe and they may have it to the full colossians 3 4 when christ who is your life appears then you also will appear with him in glory and if the spirit, this is uh, Romans eight eleven. if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. And, and Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, Paul's praying. And he says that, that we've, he's praying for the people that they would have his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength which he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly realm. See, the resurrection and our trust in it, our faith and our belief, he says, as we believe in this, as we put our faith in this truth that that God doesn't die but lives, that death never gets the final word, that actually brings this zoe, this spiritual life power into us that can never be taken away. To let that faith in what Jesus has done and is doing bring life to you. And then as we go out, we carry that with us everywhere we go. Into every situation of death, this spiritual life that comes from the Trinity because of the resurrection flows through us. We wait all year for Sunday morning on Resurrection Sunday to say, He is risen, He is risen indeed. And the reality is our lives should be saying that to everybody we come in contact with every single day. I I was struggling for a metaphor, an analogy, a story to close with today. And the funniest thing, God never works in the way you think. But many of you know a a friend of ours who died several years ago. His name was Robert. Robert used to sit right down on the front pew and sleep through every single sermon. He would always come in about halfway through the service and plop down. And I knew I was really having a good sermon if I could hear him go (sighs) in the middle of the sermon. But Robert had some mental issues. He was, a little, he was mentally disabled. He had a difficult situation. But, but I had some of the best and most profound spiritual conversations of my life with Robert. And I remember one time we were sitting there and he, he said, what's the blankety blank Bible about anyway? And so I was telling him about, about uh, 
Jesus coming and restoring and renewing a relationship with us so that we could be with God. And he said, well, that heaven, it sounds pretty good. He should write a book about that. And I said, well, he, he did, Bob, it's the Bible. And so he said to me, and I love this, he said, so I'll be sitting in my trailer watching hockey one night and Jesus will open the door and say, Bob, it's time to go. And I said, well, yeah, that's kind of what it'll be, Bob. And he said, okay, that's good. He, he liked that idea. And I, I remember that. And, and one of the things I want you to see about Rocky was he, God came to him where he was, even in his trailer watching hockey. He, he was going to let God come and get him right there. The other thing I remember about Robert was when he came to Sunday school, he would come and he would get his cup of coffee and then he would walk back to his seat. And, and on Monday morning, if I came into the church, I could tell exactly where Robert had sat because there was a trail of coffee. Because as Robert walked, he spilled coffee and then he'd go and get another. And you could see the trail of coffee along the gym floor from the coffee pot to his seat. And, and it just hit me that that's exactly what the life of God should be for us. We should be so filled with this Zoe, this life of God, because we believe that resurrection comes to dead places, that everywhere we go, we're spilling it everywhere. And people look along behind us and they see the trail of the life of God. They see that our life says he is risen. He is risen indeed. To leave a trail of life everywhere we go. That's what happens if, if by faith we believe that Jesus rose again. If we appropriate that into our own life, in our darkness, in our death, in our failures, if we let him come to where we are and receive what he's given and believe that that can change not only our lives, but the lives of all of us around so that our lives say every single day, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. God, we want that to spill out of our lives. We want the truth that you have, have brought death, you've defeated death, you brought life out of death, you've taken this place where nobody had any hope, this tomb that was covered with a stone and you've opened it up and come alive. And it wasn't just a, a concept, but it was, it was engaging real people, Mary, Peter, John, the disciples, Thomas, all of them being forced by your life to reorient everything about them around a relationship with you as you draw us together. God, I pray that would be us this week as we go out of our homes and see each other from six feet away, as we, we, we hover at a distance in the grocery store, as we wave from across the street as we walk, that our lives would scream, He is risen, He is risen indeed, that even in the darkness and death of our lives, even in the pain that we experience, that we can see you bringing life into that, resurrection power. And may it flow out through us and spill all over any that come near to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus,
Charlie and the steer. Jesus, I hope maybe you all will see. close with that video that we opened with because I want you to see it again. It's, it's just a powerful image of the fact that God comes into dead and dying places and brings life. And I want you to think about wherever you are. You're obviously not here this morning. I miss you. Uh, but wherever you are physically, wherever you are spiritually, metaphorically, wherever you are emotionally, even if it's dark and dead, I want you to realize that it, it can't be any worse than the tomb where the dead God was laying, and life came to that place. So hear these words as we close today. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.